people. They're usually the worst kind of monsters. I hope you're ready, for tonight we are going to venture into the twisted world of those who you would rather not meet. So get comfortable, grab a blanket, and let the darkness take control. To set the tone, I always hated the town I lived in. I moved there alone when I was 18 for college, and quickly regretted it. It was a decent sized town, but full of not decent people. Nearly every gas station was robbed frequently. There were shootings in broad daylight, robberies, you name it. Well, for the first three years, I lived with roommates on a side of town that wasn't awful, but it was sketchy. So when I was making decent enough money, I moved out on my own. The house was tiny, maybe 500 square foot, if that. Super old and poorly built. It was just me living there. So I didn't mind how small it was, but what originally sold me was that it was in the middle of nowhere. I was surrounded by a bunch of fields and some wooded areas with only a few houses nearby. Considering I hated being in town due to the continuous paranoia of getting mugged or shot, I loved the idea of living there. So at the beginning of July, I moved in. Everything seemed super swell, minus not being able to get good internet. A month goes by, and everything is still swell, to me at least, and I decide to get a dog and keep me company. He also loved the place, and spent long amounts of time lounging about the yard and trying to convince the nearest neighbour to walk over and pet him. Roughly two months into living there, I started noticing things out of place. Something to note is that an old roommate of mine was using my spare room as a storage space until he got himself moved out. So he had a key, but was never there. He just kind of popped in every week or so to grab something and usually would let me know beforehand. But I'd come home to my kitchen chair being pulled away from the table, or a bowl in the sink, things like that. There were such small things that I wrote them off, and just assumed my roommate swinged by, or that I was just forgetting stuff. But then my dog developed this crazy bad separation anxiety. Up until now, he didn't even care when I left. He'd just lay on the couch and chew his toys. He never barked, never did anything weird. However, all of a sudden, he began acting really awful every time I tried to leave him. He'd literally cram his body through the door while I was closing it, screaming and barking, and wouldn't stop until I came back into the house. He didn't want me to leave him there alone, at all. I couldn't afford a kennel for him just yet, so I decided one day that I'd put a movie on, thinking that maybe the sound of people talking might keep him calm. I only had to finish one task at work, and I knew I'd be home early. So I put in a copy of Hamlet. I know, boring. But I chose it because the copy I have is five hours long. And I knew it would be playing when I came home. Fast forward three hours later, long before Hamlet should have even been over. But when I walked in the door, not only was the movie not playing, but the TV and Xbox were completely off. I immediately called my roommate and asked if he had been over, and he wasn't even in town. I explained the TV situation to him, 
and he shrugged it off as the TV powering off when it's idle for a while. Even though this is true, there are several reasons I know this isn't the case. One, it wasn't idling. Two, a five hour long movie was supposed to be playing. Three, even if it had shut off, my Xbox wouldn't have. I've left it on by accident for weeks when I've gone out of town or whatever, and it was still on when I came home. Always. But it was completely powered down this time. The weird thing is, none of my stuff was missing, and the door was locked when I entered. I eventually convinced myself it was something weird with the Xbox or whatever, and tried my best to shrug it off. That is until my dog started acting even weird. Remember earlier when I mentioned that he used to play with a neighbor? Well, all of a sudden, if she even walked by the house while he was out, he'd start yelping and running at me away from her. This was incredibly weird to me and made me incredibly cautious of her. I put some cheap alarms on the door, the kind that go off when the door is opened and slept with my pistol handy. The second night, the alarms were on my door and I was woken up by the one on the back door going off. I flew out of bed with my pistol, trying to convince myself that I was about to shoot some intruder. But once I got to the door, it was shut and nobody was there. The alarm had been knocked all the way across the room. The door would have had to open for it to be chucked like that. It couldn't have fallen off and landed there. Something else weird. The door was locked, but not the way I had locked it. I always locked the knob and the deadbolt, but upon checking the lock after this, only the doorknob was locked. The police wouldn't do much as I had no witnesses, no lead, and they didn't have much to go on. Needless to say, I changed the alarms. I didn't have any noticeable problems inside after that, but later found out that the close neighbour that my dog had hated previously had previously lived in the house I was renting, and the locks had never been changed. I have no way to prove my theory, but it's pretty obvious she had a spare key, and was coming and going as she pleased. Why, though, I can't figure out. Nothing of mine ever went missing. The most unsettling part for me was that she tried to come in in the night until the alarms scared her off. How many times had she been in my house while I was asleep, and why? This incident happened at my dad's house a couple of years ago. It is also relevant to the story to note that my parents are the loveliest and most devoted couple that I know. And after years of marriage, my father's work situation changed, which meant that he had to move away for a while. This was unfortunate, but my mum and my family couldn't move away because her parents were quite unwell. So with much reluctance, my father had to rent another house elsewhere, at least until the work he was doing finished. But they often see each other on weekends. Anyway, my dad lives in a town of about 25,000 people, and it's pretty blue collar for the most part his house is in the downtown area, which has been regentrified, so it's not a bad area to live in. But it's also just a stone's throw away from the worst parts of town. My dad's house is also directly across the street from the main entrance to a university. So there's a university security checkpoint just a few steps away from his front door that is manned by real police 24 7. Now my father's house is older 
and has a detached garage in the back. His backyard is surrounded by a brick wall with two wrought iron gates, neither of which have a lock on them, since everyone usually enters through the back door. It's just really inconvenient to have a padlock on the back gates that you constantly have to lock and unlock, come rain or shine. The garage door can only be opened using a special key code. Inside the back gate, on the side of the garage, is a small crawl through space that was covered with a board at the time. We have no idea why this weird little space was put there, unless it once housed an AC unit for the previous owner's workshop in the garage. One weekend, my mum arrived to visit and was looking through the garage for some of her things that she had stored there. She was particularly looking for a large floral duffel bag where she stored her sewing machine. Her sewing machine was still in the garage, but the floral duffel was nowhere to be found. She asked my father where it was, assuming that he had used it as a suitcase since he does travel overnight occasionally for work. He told her that he hadn't touched it and that it should still be in the garage where she left it. They both shrugged it off, assuming that one of them had simply misplaced it and forgotten where it was. Fast forward to a couple of weeks later. My mom is back to visit my dad and I'm also there with my own daughter. My dad walks out to the back door one morning and notices that the board on the little crawl through space was damaged, as if it had been kicked in. He decided to go into the garage to investigate. Soon after, he called my mum and I into the garage to see what he had found. There was a piece of rolled up newspaper that was charred black on one end. Someone had opened the back gate at night, kicked the board over in the crawl space and lit a piece of newspaper on fire to use as a torch as they glanced around the garage for presumably anything of value. And the freaky part is, they did all of this within a hundred meters of a police security checkpoint while the four of us were sleeping just inside the back door. And we were lucky that they didn't find the spare house keys hung on a nail inside the garage. My dad put two and two together and realized this was probably the burglar's second entrance into the garage. A couple of weeks before when my mum's floral duffel bag disappeared, my dad had noticed that the board covering that crawl space seemed loose and had taken steps to tack it from the inside. He assumed that the burglar originally entered through the same space and stole the duffel bag, either planning to use it to store items that he would steal from other houses, or use it upon his return to my dad's garage a couple of weeks later to gather items of value. Perhaps he was spooked the first time or something and ran off. After the second incident, my dad had thicker board nails placed on the inside and outside of the crawl space. It has remained untouched ever since. But to this day, my mum always thinks twice before opening the garage door when it's dark outside. And my dad keeps a baseball bat right next to the back door. We're just glad the guy's makeshift newspaper torch didn't provide him with enough light to find the spare house key and enter while we were all asleep in our beds that night. He was never caught, of course, but we're glad that he never came back. On a side note though, my dad is retiring soon and fortunately is gonna go back and live in the family home later in the year. This happened to me several months ago. It was back in winter, 
And I was in the city because one of my professional colleagues invited me to a conference. I was due to graduate shortly and was looking for work in my field, or at least related. The conference was held in a very tall and beautiful building and required security to enter. For the event, I had gotten my own event pass. I saw the man who was organizing it and greeted him. The event took three hours, and when it was over, we were all free to network in the area outside of the auditorium. I was standing outside the auditorium and chatted with one or two more people when a guy who looked like he was in his 20s approached me. He was wearing a suit, which looked far too big for him. He was about an inch taller than me. I'm no more than 5'3", and he asked me if I would like to work for a Fortune 500 company. I said, yes, but it would have to depend on what type of company and work it is. He continued to use some persuasive tactics to get me to listen to him and talk for a couple of minutes. At the time, I was previously working at a hospital and it was written on my event pass. The fact that I worked at the hospital seemed to motivate him more to talk to me, even though I was not interested. He continued to ask me more questions. As an innocent person, I told him, since it was a professional event and I thought he was a recruiter. He asked me what I did and what I was doing there. I told him that I knew the organizer and he invited me to help me find a career. He then said he would like to offer me the opportunity to make some side money. I didn't know what he was talking about, but since I told him I worked in biotech, he started talking about some inventions, such as the human barcode, which I told him was fake. He reassured me that it was true, even though I thought it was not. He told me the company he worked for is a Fortune 500 company. I asked him which company, but of course he kept dodging the question. It unnerved me that he couldn't just tell me the company's name. He asked for my number so that he could contact me regarding the position and being unemployed at the time. I let that dismiss me from the mystery and red flags. As uncomfortable as it was, I said I had to go, and left the event. He did contact me shortly, and kept messaging me about how he looks forward to seeing me discuss the actual work. The day of the interview comes around. I got dressed professionally, preparing for the meeting which I thought I was about to have at a company building. Once I got to the address, I discovered it was a building but he only gave me the address to tell me to wait there. I was dumbfounded again. I should have turned around and left. He was late to his own meeting. I waited in the lobby, anticipating that he'd come down and take me to the company floor. But instead, he arrived at the elevator and started walking towards the exit. He said the meeting would be elsewhere. He walked down the street and it was busy outside with people walking about. He took me to a Starbucks and said we'd have the meeting there. I felt uncomfortable and thought it was unprofessional to have a meeting there. I already had coffee with me. He ordered one for himself and we sat down in the high stalls, which had an outside view. He took out his phone charger and said that his presentation was on his phone, but that his battery was dying. The guy was starting to creep me out, and I wanted out of the situation. I was unnerved from the entire sketchiness of this. What sort of company was he even representing? Finally, the presentation started on his tiny little phone, which was basically a video. Then proceeded to tell me about a company that sells merchandise through a franchise model. 
He spoke of how wealthy I could be, and how many cars I could have, and how I could have all the money I wanted. But the thing is, I really didn't care about cars, money or vacations. It just felt like an uncomfortable coax to get me to join this sketchy business. He proceeded to take out a ratty, little, wrinkled notepad and got to a blank sheet of paper where he drew out how the company works. He drew out branching franchises through a pyramid and he continued to show his presentation and I kept looking at my watch wanting to leave in discomfort. My conscience would tell me that something was wrong here, and whenever I would try and ask to see fine prints and point things out, he'd evade it and completely ignore it. He continued this pattern until we finished. He then took out a pamphlet wrapped in plastic. It was just a brochure about the work. The strange thing is that even though this entire presentation and having the brochure not once the company name was mentioned or written anywhere. I wanted to ask at least one time what the company's name was, but I figured this person was too full of himself to admit that, even when someone asked a justified question, that he can just dismiss it. It would be a waste of my time. He continued to remark that I'd be great for the work, and they'd have meetings every week, he told me that the original workshop would cost a hundred dollars, but after that I'd be making so much money that it would be nothing. He asked again to set up a meeting, to make sure that he'd see me again with aggression. I thought to make sure to myself that I wasn't going to be there. Before I left to get the hell away from him, what he said next still brings a chill down my spine. I need that brochure back, so let's meet again next week, with a wicked smirk. I smiled, and facetiously remarked, Oh yeah, I have a meeting, but contact me so we can plan ahead. And I noped out of there. Later on in the evening, I met up with some friends in the city for a volunteering thing, and I told them about what happened, and thinking that it was a real interview. My old co-worker told me it sounded very much like a pyramid scheme, and he heard that people lose more money than they gain. Later that night, the guy contacted me again through text. He texted me again later in the week and said, Hello, can we meet this week? I told him no, that I had a meeting and would be busy. The week after, he sternly texted me, Hello, Josh, I have to speak with you. I ignored it. These constant barrages of text persisted for the next few months. I'd occasionally get a text from him, out of nowhere, wanting to talk and see me. For what reason? I did not owe anything to him, nor did I want to work for the sketchy company. I simply wanted him to stop bothering me, so I texted him that I wasn't interested and said goodbye. Even after that, the messages persisted. Luckily, my number changed a month ago, and I have not been contacted by him since. But I wonder if on a dark night, he messages that number with the grim text, Hey, I'd like to talk to you. I've told my organiser colleague about what happened. I was hoping he would do something about these sketchy solicitors, and that they wouldn't return to the building. The amount of times he messaged me were just creepy. It's unnerving how these people, once they think they've got a hold of you, won't let go until you buy into their bullshit. Be safe, people. I hope to never meet anyone like that again. My stepfather is an idiot. He is an ex-alcoholic slash drug addict who is heavily involved in several Catholic churches and the local AA community. AA being Alcoholics Anonymous. The drugs and alcohol must have seriously fried his brain because he still has really bad judgment and decision-making skills, especially when it comes to people. He's brought so many sketchy people into my life, 
Thank God nothing seriously happened. I get it. He's trying to help others who are struggling with the same battle he went through. And maybe he's making a difference in some people's lives. But he's been bringing these kind of people into my life since I was about four. Some of them even lived with us for a while. I had kids young. I was 20 when I had my son, and 23 when I had my daughter. When my son had his first birthday, my stepdad and mum retired. My mum had me when she was 40, and decided to travel, going on mission trips with their church and moving to another state. They started working with this Catholic organisation that specifically helps people who struggle with alcohol and drug addictions. The church gave them housing amongst their nuns and priests and paid them a small amount of money to buy food and necessities while they worked with them. One year around Christmas time, my parents came home for the holidays and brought an elder nun with them. She was probably in her fifties. My family got together and went to a Santa's workshop which was super crowded. My mother, stepfather and their nun friend and my sister and their kids came too. My daughter was about six months old. She is a beautiful red-headed baby. I had received many comments from family and strangers on how beautiful her red hair was and probably have a few other stories about how people who don't understand personal boundaries regarding children behaved. The nun was immediately taken by how beautiful my baby was and kept touching her, talking to her and wanting to hold her. It was immediately uncomfortable because this was my first time meeting with her. Also, she wasn't acting this way with any other children that were with us. My son, who was three years old at the time, and has since been diagnosed with ADHD, was a handful and running all over the place getting into everything. It's so hard going places with them without their dad. And he didn't come because he was working. So I think I was distracted because my son was getting into something he wasn't supposed to. And I let go of the stroller for a second, and the nun immediately took it. She told me she would give me a break, and since she was a friend of my parents and my family were all around us, I decided to let the nun push my daughter in the stroller. Another incident happened where my son was getting into something, and I was distracted. It was less than a minute, and when I turned around, my daughter and the nun were gone. I freaked out, and my whole family was still around me and no one knew where this nun went. She didn't say anything to anyone about leaving. My family and I immediately started looking everywhere. Luckily, there were so many of us that we found the nun at the front of the building, right near the exit. It was terrifying. When we found her, she just said she was taking my daughter on a stroll. I decided to leave right after that happened. And so did everyone else in my family. And luckily, I haven't seen her since. But I know what she wanted to do. I would also like to mention that the nun gave off some weird vibes and said some strange comments about how if she hadn't become a nun and her children, she imagined they would look just like my daughter because red hair runs in her family. Another small but interesting detail is my older sister, who was there too with her three kids, who also had a baby girl, who was a couple of months older at the time. I didn't understand why the nun latched onto my daughter in particular, other than her having red hair. Is hair colour that big of a deal? Or would it have been because I was a young mother and didn't have their father with me? Let me set up stage here. I'm a 20 something year old woman. I'm out of college, support myself independently, and I'm basically a real grown up. However, 
I look like a 16 year old and when not at work frequently dressed like it I moved away from my hometown to live in a major city but come back to visit this weekend for a few days I met up with my friend from high school last night who also happened to have long since to move away from our hometown but was also home visiting we ended up deciding to go smoke in this weird park-like area that we used to smoke in when we were younger. Neither of us had been to it in a number of years. I don't know if I would necessarily say that it had gotten sketchier, but more so, I would say that as adults, we were more conscientious of the fact that it was kind of a sketchy area to be in. Anyway, we ran into this group of folk and we estimated them to be around college age. Definitely dirty hippies. Definitely the type of people who would be smoking weed in public. Nonetheless, they had hash they were sharing and we ended up hanging out with them. There was something off about these guys. Neither of us could quite put our finger on it about what their deal was at the time. But my friend said it was like meeting someone from Tumblr that you argued with and subsequently blocked in real life. I'm going to have to agree. I can't really give damning slash specific quotes, but they just spoke weirdly about things like community, polygamy, freedom, happiness, communism, the greater good, etc. They just generally had a bizarre mannerism and were speaking passionately about what seemed to be anarchistic ideals and they talked to us like they knew us. I don't really know how to describe it but they acted overly familiar with us. It was to a point where it definitely got uncomfortable. It was not how normal persons would speak to someone they had just decided to befriend. As someone was replacing a bowl my friend and I gave each other a knowing look and decided it was time to bounce. He quickly said we were meeting up with his parents for dinner and needed to get going. They proceeded to invite us back to their intentional community tonight after we were done with his parents. When we asked what the hell that was, they said they belonged to new culture and that we were welcome to come to one of their workshops. They proceeded to give us directions to somewhere down a rural highway outside of town and neither of us were really listening and asked for our number. I explained that we both lived out of state and were just visiting and we actually had to go now and we made a swift exit. We both felt a strong and inexplicable urge to get out of their ASAP. For me personally, I just all of a sudden felt really unsafe. My friend and I were in agreement that the whole interaction started out kind of suspicious and was just violently snowballing downhill with each passing minute. Eventually, enough was enough. We went back to his house and his stepdad asked where we had gone and we casually told him we met some weirdos in the park and said they belonged to some group. He went on to say that they've been warning people that there are reports of a decentralized cult lurking in the area and they're preying on runaway teens and college dropouts and trafficking them into Appalachia. As soon as he said that and started talking about it, it all kind of fell together. So that's what was happening there. Yeah, it looks like we may have found the cult. To be completely honest, men never hit on me or approach me at all. This is because I am a very large woman. It is weird when they do. It's only happened twice in the last six or seven years. The first of those times was okay, but a little uncomfortable since I was in an elevator with this complete stranger in my apartment building and he kept asking me out for coffee. 
I know I'm not attractive, so I never believe people when they act like I am. I am also not looking to date. The second time, however, happened within the last hour. After work, I took the bus down to the grocery store. It is a few minutes in the opposite direction from my apartment, but they have some pretty good deals, so I like to go at least once a month. As I was starting to walk away from the bulk food area, this is also the only store with sesame glazed cashews, so I was getting some. I heard someone say something like, "Hey," there were other people in the area. So I figured this person was trying to get the attention of a deli or bakery employee nearby. I saw him out of the corner of my eye, but paid no attention and walked off to continue my shopping. I had to use the phone in the store that automatically rings up the taxi company to call my ride before exiting, and walk off to the side where the benches are to wait. For it to arrive, a few people walked behind the bench, as they left. Also, then one stopped, and said hello. I still paid no attention. The only person I talk to, besides customers at work, is my sister, and she was back in my apartment. He came a little closer, cleared his throat, and said, "Excuse me." I turned. It was the guy. It was then I realised he had been trying to get my attention inside the store earlier. Oh, hello, I smiled. I really am anxious out in public, but I am decent at faking friendliness. Do you live round here? No, I'm just waiting for my ride home. Ah, you know I just live over there. He pointed at the townhouse complex across the street. I can give you a ride if you'd like. Well, that was fast and forward. Oh, thanks, but that's all right. I already called my ride, and it's on its way. Are you certain he's coming? Because there's no problem to drive you. I assured him that my ride was surely on its way. He kept trying over and over to get me to come with him, despite my polite refusal. He offered to put his phone number in my phone, so that I could call him, any time, day or night, and that he would come and pick me up. Well, that was creepy. I told him the truth, and said I didn't have a cell phone. He immediately challenged me by asking how I called for a ride. Then I said. That there is a phone inside the store that I could use. He chuckled and asked, "What are you worried about? If I gave you a ride, your husband would kill me." Husband, yeah, right. I'm thirty-five and had never even had a boyfriend. Oh, he might. He can get like that sometimes. Better if I just take a cab when it arrives. I lied. Well, you don't have to tell him that I gave you a ride. That wouldn't be very honest of me. Besides, the folk at the taxi company know who I am, so I can't just no-show them, which is true. I've been a regular for the past six years, and they know me by now. He then asked where I'm from. I said that I was from the general area. He then said that he was from Africa. I could tell that already, so I just politely asked which country. He told me. And then started talking about being from a tribe, and how tribes would fight each other for things, mostly about how whichever tribe won, they could marry women from the other tribe, and not have to pay for that privilege and whatnot. I was just praying that my cab would come soon, and I kept turning to check. Finally, it arrived. I stood up and said, "Looks like my ride's here." He said that it was nice to talk to me, as we were putting the bags in the car. I hopped in the cab, thanked the cabbie for finally saving me, and we were off. That guy must have offered me a ride at least a dozen times. 
but that wasn't the end of it. As I was getting my stuff out of the cab once arriving at my complex, the man drove past me. He doesn't live here too. He followed me. I don't know what he hoped to accomplish, since the buildings are secured and he doesn't know my first name, let alone my last, which is the only name listed beside the buzzer. I hustled my fat butt into the building and hoped I don't ever meet that guy again. Hey guys.